Uh, earlier this evening, somebody came in the door and said, why is, why is Southwestern College doing this? Uh, one of the reasons we're doing it is that about 70% of our students uh, that we serve in our professional studies unit are active duty military mem service members. So it seemed like a good idea to have a, a, a major general show up and offer a few comments. We thought it might be good for the students. The other reason we do is that uh, our institution picks a theme every year and this year the theme is courage. Turns out a marine kind of fits the profile. So the last reason we're doing it is that this presentation is provided with generous support from the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. Southwestern College is a private institution. We do not accept or use uh, uh, state funding to run our operation. We're part of a council of independent colleges and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation provides this opportunity to institutions such as ours. So we're very fortunate tonight to, to welcome Major General Michael Leonard. General Leonard is perhaps most notable for his role at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, originally placed in charge of 13 refugee camps in 2002, he oversaw its transformations into a detention facility for suspected members of Al-Qaeda and Taliban. Disagreeing with the tactics used there, he has publicly expressed his opinion that the facility needs to be shut down. The general left Guantanamo Bay in 2003 and deployed to CENTCOM Theater and took part in Operation Iraqi Freedom, where he served as commander for Marine Logistics Command. He returned to the United States in 2005 and assumed command of Marine Corps Installations West. His many decorations include the Defense Superior Service Medal with One Oak Leaf Cluster, Legion of Merit Award with Gold Star, and Defense Meritorious Service Medal with Two Oak Leaf Clusters. General Leonard. As I said, his participation here is uh, uh, made possible through the Woodrow Wilson Visiting Scholars Program. Please extend a warm Wichita welcome to Major General Michael Leonard. Okay, good news. The speech I prepared is right here. And, uh, we're ready to go. Well, first off, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is actually my first time, not the first time I've ever been in Kansas, but uh, the first time that I've ever been able to be in Kansas for a, a uh, extended period of time and get an opportunity to meet with uh, the local residents. And, and perhaps most importantly, many of the, the great young students that, uh, that you sent to uh, Southwestern College. Uh, I have to tell you the very best well, first off, the, the part that I miss most after 37 years in the Marine Corps is the opportunity to interact with young Marines. So when I was asked to come on board as a Woodrow Wilson visiting fellow, and it was explained to me that I was going to be able to interact with uh, uh, young students who uh, were about the same age and background as my Marines, and uh, faculty members as well, then that turned out to be a pretty good deal. So this has been an extraordinary experience for me as well, and I appreciate the hospitality that has been shown to me by this, this great state. Uh, I've been asked to come here tonight to talk about terrorism. And the men and women who fight against terrorism and who serve our armed forces wherever our nation's leaders send them. I'm going to challenge some of your firmly held beliefs tonight, whether you occupy the left, the right or the center of the political spectrum. In other words, I'm probably going to say some things that you disagree with, and for some of you, I may even make some of you mad. I'll not apologize beforehand, but I will say to you that my objective is to make all of us think because we tend to live in the moment. That's because the demands of our lives place us there. Tonight, I'm going to try to get you to reflect not just backward, but also to look forward to imagine the kind of America and the kind of world that our kids will live in. As a Woodrow Wilson visiting fellow, I talk to a lot of students around the country, and it's often easy to forget that most of them were children on that dark day. The terrorists hijacked four U.S. planes and flew them into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and an open field in Pennsylvania, killing over 3,000 souls of all nationalities, all religions, and multiple ethnicities. The target of that attack, however, misplaced, was the United States, and the others were simply collateral damage. Since that attack, 
our military has been continuously deployed throughout the world, striving to ensure that the terror, for the terrorists, at least, this fight is an away game and that they cannot gain further access to American soil. Taken in total, the armed forces and our government have been relatively successful in ensuring that that happens. Law enforcement officials appear to be getting better at thwarting terrorist attacks, but they can't stop all of them. So the first thing I'm going to do is get you to think about is how much risk does the average American face from terrorists? And I was asked that question several times tonight as I was just going around the table. What are your chances of dying in a terrorist attack? Well, first, let's put things in perspective. What are your chances of dying of something else? According to best statistics we can find, your chances of dying of heart disease or cancer in your lifetime are one in seven for each or, taken together, two in seven. Your chances of being killed as a consequence of assault by firearm are one in 340. They are one in 108 of dying in a car accident. Of being hit by lightning, they are one in 126,000, though if you are male, the chances are higher. Some of us guys need to be told to get out of the rain. Your odds of being killed in a terrorist attack are one in 20 million. If you adjust for a lifetime of 80 years, and let's hope all of us make it that long, that's still odds of one in 250,000. Both the Washington Post and The Economist have reported similar numbers. I pr provide this, this information to put the danger in appropriate perspective. It's not my intention to say that terrorists are not terrible people, but to simply tell you that for most of you in this room, they are unlikely to be successful in killing you. There's a more important point. The objective of terrorism is to change behavior. Think about what the word terrorist means, terror. And they want to change our behavior. They want us to live in fear, and when we modify our behavior because we are afraid, the terrorists have won. They don't need to kill us. They only need to change us. When we make changes to our lifestyle, and agree to have our personal liberties circumscribed in the name of fighting terrorism, we have in fact ceded the field to terrorists. They would like to see their crimes escalate into a religious war, to pull into the fight the millions of law-abiding Muslims to take up arms against Christians and Jews. If we allow this to become a religious war, they win. In their own way, their actions have a perverse logic. When we treat terrorists as they would treat us, in essence, we become them. This country was built upon some fundamental principles enshrined in the rule of law and codified in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Thousands of brave men and women over many generations have fought and died over the years to protect those freedoms and those liberties. When we battle terrorists, we need to be careful that we don't sacrifice those freedoms in the name of winning. If we do, we find ourselves in the same paradoxical situation that we did in Vietnam when the troops reported we had to save the village, so we burned it. Most of you know that I was the commander who, owned the Guantanamo, who opened the Guantanamo de, uh, detention facility. Some of you know I tried to run it according to humane methods and as close as possible to the pr principles of the Geneva Conventions. I didn't do this because I'm a softie or a terrorist sympathizer, but because I took an oath to the Constitution of the United States and that oath required me to support the ideals embodied in the Constitution. I also recognize that if we got it wrong, Guantanamo could become a rallying cry for terrorist sympathizers and a recruiting tool for the Al-Qaeda and those who followed them. 
That's what happened. Some of you may know that I've said we need to close the facility. By taking that position, I am in a minority because a small minority of the American people believe we should continue to operate, because it, we should not continue to operate Guantanamo. Most Americans, when I say most, over 50%, it's close, believe that we should keep Guantanamo open. Their support for the prison seldom considers what we stand for as Americans, but is based upon the fear that if released or even incarcerated in their country of origins, that some will return to the fight. Some will, and when they do, we'll kill them. Most, however, and most have that we've released, have gone back to their lives, and an institution that has been a black mark on our nation's history will be gone. I think you could legitimately challenge me by saying, OK, General, we fought the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and now we're seeing an even more powerful forces in ISIS. What do you propose we do about them? It's a legitimate question. No administration, either this one or whichever administration that follows them, will be able to ignore the existential threat that is represented by ISIS. Sadly, most of the debate I hear in Washington revolves around whose fault it is that brought us here today. Let's settle this debate by saying that there is plenty of fault to go around. My old uh, German grandmother used to say, if you point a finger at somebody, there's three pointing back at you. We could begin with the rift in 662 AD that created the Sunni and Shiite denominations of Islam following the death of Muhammad. We could start there. We could blame the secret Sykes-Picot agreement that established the current map of the Middle East with little regard for ethnic or tribal distinctions. We could blame the Bush administration for the decision to invade Iraq, uh, thus accelerating the fissures that existed well before Saddam Hussein. Or we could blame the Obama administration for the decision to leave Iraq without setting the conditions for success, assuming that could have been done, and for or for waffling on Syria when they gassed their own populations. There's a lot of blame to go around. <coughs> However, blaming somebody else isn't going to solve the problem. In the words of Colin Powell, once you break it, you're going to own it, and we're going to be responsible for the 26 million people standing there looking at us, and it's going to suck up a good 40 to 50 percent of the army for years, and it's going to take all of the oxygen out of the political environment. That's what he said over 10 years ago, and I think he got it pretty much right. Our political le leaders and our law enforcement officials and our military face a dilemma. The American people demand security, even in the face of loss of liberty, and no official, political official, is going to be satisfied with saying that you are 99.9% .9 secure. So what's in our future? First, we are all going to die. Most of us will die of disease cancer and heart attacks being the most likely that we will succumb in that fashion. Some of us will die violently, probably at the point of a gun held by an American or in a car crash on a U.S. highway. A statistic insignificant number of us will be killed by terrorists. Now, if you are the person killed by a terrorist or a family member, there is no real upside to the news that you did the equivalent of hitting the bad luck lottery. Dead is dead. All of us will give up some personal freedoms in order to feel safer when we fly, when we cross a border, when we fill out a form, or when we are stopped by a law enforcement officer. There will be less privacy of information. For many of you, that doesn't bother you. You've already given up a great deal of privacy if you use Facebook, make a purchase either online or in a store, respond to email surveys, or have an email account. Perhaps the issue is less whether or not your personal, personal information is being collected in the name of your security or delivering an enhanced shopping opportunity. Then what organizations who collect this data do with it? U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies have become much better at sharing information. And that's a good thing. Sharing information about potential bad guys is good, but remember, among those few goats are a lot of sheep, and their data is being collected as well. I don't support the actions of Edward Snowden. I'm going to anticipate that question right now. 
He broke the law. And even if it was for what for him was an ethical reason, he fled the scene rather than have the matter decided under our laws. However, in some perverse way, it would be useful if Snowden's actions triggered a national debate over how we achieve a balance between security and privacy. I'm going to shift gears here and talk to you about the members of the armed forces who are on duty every single day to ensure that your chances of dying in a terrorist attack during your lifetime stay around 1 in 20 million. For those who wear the uniform, the chances of being killed or maimed are much, much higher. Armed forces have been continuously at war since 2001. Many of you know troops who have deployed not once, but not twice, but six, seven, eight times. If you visited the hospitals at Walter Reed and later Bethesda, you will see wards of young men and women missing limbs, eyes, or suffering from the signature injury of the war, traumatic brain injury from improvised explosive devices. One of the lessons learned from Vietnam was it was almost impossible to fight a long war with a draft military. The American people will not support it. When we turned to an all-volunteer force, we created perhaps the finest fighting force that the world has ever seen. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, it still is. Now at this point is where I generally get in trouble because when I say that after my talk, some old soldier from Korea or Vietnam is likely to come up and say that they felt insulted because they were pretty damned good soldiers. And let me say to you that you fought bravely in those wars. I will concede your courage and ability, but I want you to think back to the units and the troops that you fought among and weren't there a fair share of knuckleheads and those who didn't want to be there along with those of you who fought so valiantly? The difference between the forces of today and the forces of yesteryear is that the percentage of knuckleheads today is much lower. I can say that with certainty with the benefit of 37 years of service. I saw nearly two generations. The troops I commanded in 2009 were vastly superior as a group than the troops I commanded in 1973. That's the good news. The bad news is that having an all-volunteer force makes it all too easy for our political leaders to commit troops because they don't have to face the downside of public pressure. In 1999, I wrote an article for Naval Proceedings called America's Janissaries. I don't know if you all know what the Janissaries were, but essentially what they were was uh, in the Ottoman Empire, they were uh, Christian slaves that were captured, most of them around the Balkan uh, region, brought down and trained to be a military. They were a slave army. They were also not the kind of slaves that you would think of in our modern context. They owned property, they, owned, uh, they, they amassed wealth, and ultimately they controlled the, uh, the Ottoman Empire. They were very, very good. But they were essentially a, uh, a hired uh, or co-opted military. Um, so I wrote this article, and I took a lot of heat for it. In 1999, uh, I warned that such a force, an all-volunteer force, could co become increasingly separated from the American people that we were creating a warrior caste, and because of that, their capability, the US military would be the solution to every problem. The article was badly received at the time. A few years later, it was being widely cited. If you doubt what I'm saying, think about our most recent response to the Ebola epidemic. There is no doubt that this is a serious international problem. Our response, did we call on the Surgeon General to tell us what to do? Oh, I'm sorry, there's no Surgeon General. We don't have one. No, we sent the military, and they're doing a darn fine job. But when the only, uh, when the only tool in your uh, toolbox is a hammer, every problem becomes a nail. Another example, you know, as, President, as our President Obama searches for solutions in the Middle East, he appointed an envoy uh, to build an international coalition among the donor states to donor nations to come aboard and to, uh, to work with us. Instead of looking for a diplomat of distinction, he brought Marine General John Allen out of retirement. Had I been in his position, in the President's position, I'd have probably done the same thing, as John Allen is an extraordinary leader, and he's a friend. 
But both my examples demonstrate that while our military has become more effective, the other organs of government seem to have lost their skills. And we need to get a balance back. Think back when we invaded Iraq and just 17 later, we, days later, we were in Baghdad. I was part of that force. When we got to Baghdad, we waited for orders to rebuild the country. We did not get those orders. We were told, nation building is not the military's job. Fine, we said. Where's the rest of the folks here to put this country back together again? The Iraqis said, okay, you broke it. How do you want us to put it back together again? Nobody came. So we spent the next several years fighting in Iraq, troops fighting and dying, and doing it bravely because we didn't put it back together again. This administration, and whatever administration comes after them, will be left with few good options. Our military is still the most powerful in the world, but I'm going to tell you the truth. They've been rode hard and they've been put away wet. Their equipment is getting tired. And we're beginning to see the effects of two years of sequestration on the force. It's hurting. The president will almost certainly have to back away from his promise of no boots on the ground because air power alone cannot defeat ISIS, particularly in the cities, unless we are willing to accept catastrophic collateral damage. Can we win this fight? Absolutely. But it will require a level of sacrifice that other than our military, the American people have so far avoided. We will need a national debate over how many of our civil liberties we are willing to forego in order to, see, to achieve the security we seem to demand. Congress must step up to the plate and either authorize the president to do what must be done or they must deny that authority and live with the consequences. But going home, back to the district, to raise money and campaign is not what Congress was paid to do. We need to recognize that taking on ISIS may become a generational commitment. For those of you of childbearing age, plan that your sons and daughters will go to war. We need to reaffirm those values that we say are uniquely American. If we claim American exceptionalism, that we are the shining city on the hill, we need to not just talk the talk, we must walk the walk. That means we don't torture, we don't invoke the values of the Constitution only when it is convenient. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate what you're, you're coming here tonight and your attention, and I'd be more than happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. My question for you is, do you believe that we should have traded foreign fighters for bird doll? No, that's a great question. Uh, the question, in case anybody didn't hear it, is should we have traded the uh, detainees that were in Guantanamo uh, for Sergeant uh, Bo Bergdahl? Um, I think that ultimately, yes, but the timing and the way of doing it was very, very bad. And let me explain myself. First off, of the approximately 155 detainees in Guantanamo right now, fully 78 of them have been cleared for release for several years because they do not face, they, 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 that competent authority has determined that they probably do not face a threat. However, the individuals that were traded were not part of that group of 78. They were senior Taliban leaders. And uh, they were uh, pretty bad guys. Uh, a couple of them were the ones that I locked up initially when I went down there. Now, the issue that the president faced is that at the conclusion of hostilities in Afghanistan, we have no legal authority to retain them. So at a certain point, we would have to release them or essentially walk away from every single international agreement that we had. But there's a problem when you essentially jump the line on the rest of them that had been cleared for release, and, and when, the, the, uh, when the, the, they looked at these guys, they said, no, you know, we want to hold on to them for a while longer. Additionally, I think that by trading them, we created a 
market for our soldiers, airmen, marines in there. We basically put a value on them. And finally, I, I think we just did it early. And, and, and probably the last issue is I, I think that failure to notify Congress created a fight that, we pro that the administration probably didn't need among all the other fights. Now, how would you, you know, there was a requirement to notify Congress on these particular movement of detainees. And whether you agree with that requirement or not, you know, the Obama administration thought it was a particularly onerous burden. Had I been advising the President, I probably would have said something like, Mr. President, you don't have to notify all of Congress. You notify the Senate and House Intelligence Committees. We pick those people for their ability to keep a secret. Explain to them that you're going to do it and why we need to do it. And at least we'll have checked that block and given Congress one less talking point for why that it was a bad idea. So I think it was an inevitable that the trade had to take place. I think that uh, it was rushed and uh, perhaps uh, uh, actually set back any efforts that we were going to have to close Guantanamo because, frankly, the folks out on the other side that don't agree with this uh, feel that uh, the, there, there was a process follow here. Did that, that answer your question, sir? Yeah, absolutely. And this was part of the no man left behind thing. And that's important to us. It's extraordinarily important. Uh, and we wanted him back, regardless of what he did or did not do. You know, and let me say, you know, the Army is going to decide uh, what kind of a soldier Bull Burdock was. And we'll leave it to the U.S. Army for that. Thank you. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what, oh, what is your opinion of how some European countries take uh, their young people right out of high school and have them uh, in the service for two years? Okay, uh, is the question perhaps, what is my feeling towards national service? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, it's interesting. I, you know, first off, with the number of young people we have today, uh, I'm not entirely a fan of national military service. But we've actually, uh, the provost and I have had this discussion. Uh, I think there is a value in this country to a year's national service. Not necessarily national military service, but national service. And perhaps we could uh, put something together that says, all right, if you come in and do a year or something of national, of national military service, you get some education benefits. Or maybe, maybe we make it voluntary, but we tie education benefits to this, and those individuals that perhaps might not have the wherewithal to get to school can get some, some benefits. And you don't have to be in the military. You can do a whole bunch of other things in this country. But I think the point you're making, ma'am, and I think we're trying to get at is, is that a sense of service in this country is an extraordinarily important thing. And you know, I've been, I've been darn lucky. The Marines and the soldiers and sailors and airmen that I work with have that sense of service. And I mean, they're just absolutely terrific people. But I kind of suspect that that's not a universal feeling in this country that that sense of service is not universal. So I'm lucky. I've had 37 years of working with people that really, you know, bleed red, white, and blue, and they did bleed. So I think that there ought to be a, 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 a debate on that. By the way, that was the 1969 debate topic, resolved that the United States should have a system of universal service for all citizens. I remember that because I was a senior and I was debating against it. Oh my. Not because I felt that it was a bad idea, just because it's often easier to debate against an idea that you support. There's a question there, I believe, in this gentleman. Yes, sir. What do you think the relationship is right now between the White House and the Pentagon? I think that the relationship well, the relationship can always be better, but I've seen it worse in administrations. I've served seven presidents, some I voted for, some I didn't. You're never going to be able to tell the difference. Um, I don't think that uh, I don't think that they talk to the Pentagon quite as much as they should. But you know, there's another part of this. There's a responsibility on the part of uniformed leaders to give good advice to, to the political leadership of this country. 
you know, the reason the political leadership gets into office is because you all elect them. And so when a general is asked for his opinion, I've seen a lot of generals get what I call a spinectomy. You know, these are people that are brave as heck, you know, able to charge that hill and face a hail of bullets, but when they get in front of somebody that's been politically appointed and he asks them, what do you think? It's blah, 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 okay? We owe our elected leaders the best possible advice we can give them. So to your answer, sir, it's a two-way street. We really need to be doing our best to give them advice and giving them options. Now, if they don't take that advice, if they don't follow those options, then that's their, that's, that's their responsibility. That's, what, that's why we elect them. But it, it works both ways. And um, I, I think that, uh, and, and I guess the excuse me, final thought is that, you know, the Pentagon is not a monolith either in terms of what the options are. And I think you, you, you're smiling. I think you probably figured that out. Um, it's not like the chairman walks in and says, all my service chiefs and all my unified commanders all agree that this is the way things should go. There's a pretty hefty debate that goes on among those four stars. They've got pretty big egos. Uh, heck, even two stars have egos. So uh, what I'm telling you is, is that there needs to be that honest debate, though, and it needs to be ra raised up above both political and service rivalries, because it's about the good of this country. It's about the future of this country, and it's about the future of our kids and our grandchildren, sir. Do you have a follow-on? Absolutely. I have to tell you a story. Uh, my, uh, my dad was an enlisted Marine, World War II in Korea. Um, he did, uh, tw he did uh, eight and a half years, got out as a gunnery sergeant. He never knew a peacetime Marine Corps because he got out between the wars. And he used to tell me, he says, you know, Mike, you're not the smartest tack in the box. But I think you're going to do okay if you take care of your troops and you listen to your staff NCOs. That's the non-commissioned officers for those of you that aren't familiar. I think Dad gave me pretty good advice. And most of them do. This is an observation more than a question. The, um, if we go back in history, after World War I, we didn't treat the Germans very nice. And um, history will show that uh, things didn't work out quite like everybody thought they would. After World War II, we had a different philosophy and a good relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, and you brought up the point about Iraq, when are we going to fix the place, or when are we going to help you know, rebuild? There's, I'm sure there are a lot of things that go on there that we never know about. And I'm sure that there are a lot of, of the military who are there that have tried to develop some friendship and maybe have and, and are doing some things individually. But I, I think we're making a big mistake in, in not falling through and like we were supposed to be doing. You mean, sir, in terms of the reconstruction in Iraq? Reconstruction, yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, Iraqis uh, have some pretty good engineers and some pretty good engineering. If you ever go by the Tigris and Euphrates and you see how they've kept that, those in their, in their riverbeds and, and their, their, just their irrigation system, it's remarkable. Uh, the big problem I think we had in Iraq is that we decided that we could come in and deliver uh, Western civil civilization and democracy and, you know, the turn of the switch and everything and, you know, and we thought that we could get them to think just like us. Um, we lacked a lot of cultural understanding. Um, we also failed to perhaps get the diplomatic, this gets back to my comments, sir, about the diplomatic piece. Uh, you know, the, uh, 
And the simple fact is, is that uh, uh, Iraq uh, essentially just moved back into the tribal factionalism and, and some of the religious factionalism that we'd seen. And uh, whoever was in power just automatically decided that it was going to be his guys that were going to make it. And uh, he, they were not thinking as a country. They were not considering uh, Iraq as a nation. It was just uh, a group of fas factionalized tribes. You know, the, 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 uh, uh, the real question is, is, is Iraq a country and is there, is there going to be a natural uh, trifurcation of Iraq? into three different uh, areas. Uh, the area around Baghdad, you know, the, the crazies that make up the, uh, the ISIS and the territory that they've been able to, uh, uh, to grab. And then Kur the Kurds, uh, who seem to be functioning probably the closest to a, a nation at this time. Uh, and I suspect that what we're going to see in a few years is, 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 a, is a breakup of that country. And the only real winners in this whole thing and the decision to go into Iraq, quite frankly, was Iran. Sir, in the back. Uh, how realistic do you think it is that uh, ISIS will uh, attack the United States? Well, you know, that's like... Uh, you know, asking the general how's, how's morale in the troop in the unit. As soon as he says morale is great, you're going to find the one guy that didn't get uh, fed last night. Uh, you know, I am less concerned about an attack on U.S. soil by ISIS than the disruption and the damage that they're doing over in the Middle East. I'm not saying it's not going to happen, sir. Uh, but I don't know that that's their primary objective at this time, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. I think that the disruption and the things that you're seeing them doing right now is what they intend to do. Uh, General, given your expertise on terrorism, if you were king, would you keep the TSA like it is, change it, or eliminate it? Oh, the transfer, oh boy. <laughs> you know, you're talking about the guy that they, they wanted in his, while he was in his general's uniform. I mean, my goodness. I might not be an objective observer. Um, I think we need to ask ourselves how much security we're getting for the money we're spending. I really do. You know, we, we're, we're kind of uh, some, somehow... Uh, you know, we're getting a little bit better, but it's it's taken a long time. You know, uh, you know, we we try to be fair in this country, so we, you know, we we do the uh, what you know the random searches. So you know, we pick some gal that uh, you know your age, ma'am. You certainly look like a terrorist. You know, and we decide that we're going to pick you because we're fair, and we want to pick you as a random random selected. You know, well, we need to get better about it. I think the Israelis actually are are are, are much better at uh, at uh, uh, these types of things. You know, I went through Singapore uh, security a, few, a couple years back, and uh, uh, the. The checks that I received, I, mean, I could tell because I do security, the, the things that they were scanning me for were much more thorough than I get in the TSA, but they didn't seem nearly as invasive. So I think we need, I don't know whether I would say get rid of the TSA, I would be more inclined to say let's really step back a minute and, and ask ourselves, you know, uh, you know, who, you know, is the, is, is the cost and the inconvenience really protecting us against anything. I'm not entirely certain. The problem is, if you're an elected or appointed leader, who's going to say we don't need it anymore? And that's the challenge we have. And that was part of my message in this thing, is anytime you give up a civil liberty, you don't get it back. It never comes back. I was talking to some young people today about when I was their age, and courting my wife when she was in Atlanta. And she would drop me off at the airport about 10 minutes before boarding time. And I would, I was fast at that time, and I would rush through that airport and get to my gate just in time to throw that boarding pass in the hands. And, and I went, and they looked at me like, I couldn't believe, I mean, you could actually do that in an airport? Yeah, you sure could. You all, most of you are of an age that remember that. 
okay? I, I always have to ask myself is what am I giving up for the security that I'm getting? But you know, this is a debate that we have to have as a nation because there, will be, there are people in this room and there are certainly people in this nation that said, oh no, I'm so worried about a terrorist attack, I'm willing to give up everything. I'm willing to give up everything. And to them I say, you know, sir, ma'am, just remember, what are the terrorist objectives? It's asymmetrical warfare, low-cost warfare, and to make us live afraid, and to change the way we live. And I, got, I would submit they're doing a pretty good job. Sir. Uh, they have given one thing back. If you get old enough like me, I don't have to take my shoes off anymore. Yes, they, sir. They, they know that people 75 and older are not going to put bombs in their shoes. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Actually, I've reached the point where they let me keep my shoes on every once in a while, sir. I guess there is an advantage to getting older. It's one of the few. Uh, sir. That, <clears throat> that's not true about not being able to take off your shoes. If you have artificial knees, yes. you'll have, still have to take off your shoes. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. Other questions? I've been waiting for you to give me a, give me a question, sir. How do you feel the news has to do with this psychological fear that you talk about? Because what I know and what I, what I hear is two different things sometimes. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the problem is, is that most of the things that happen in this world don't sell newspapers. The terrorist objective is to get as much news as they possibly can. So they're going to do something big. They're going to do something dramatic. And guess what? Our news outlets are going to do what they get paid to do and they're going to report it. And everybody is going to get really, really scared. Now, I am not telling you that terrorists are not bad people. They are horrible people. Remember, I was the first guy who locked them up and I was in a position to actually talk to some of them. I talked to many of them. They don't think like us. And they're not nice people, and none of them are sending me Christmas cards. And I'm not trying to be flippant. They are not nice people. But at the same time, we have to consider what their objectives are. And their objectives are to change us and to make us afraid. You know, when I, uh, when I went to, we, we, when the Marines came to get ready to go into Iraq, we went to Kuwait. And we were welcomed in Kuwait. Kuwait's a pretty, pretty good Pretty good country, and uh, they've got English language newspapers. And uh, the uh, the first thing that happened was is that the new, when I within a week of me arriving, it said Brigadier General Mike Leonard, first commander of the detention facility in Guantanamo Bay, has arrived with his Marine forces. Front page stuff, and it was in English and in Arabic. And a couple of other generals said, you know, are you going to uh, are you going to uh, ramp up your security detail? Oh, no. Not going to do that. They know where to find me. I got about 5,000 Marines and sailors here. I'm not particularly worried. But my own personal security detail was uh, one Marine sergeant and two corporals. That was it. And I traveled all over the country. You know, you just can't allow yourself to live in fear. Now juxtapose that is when I went home and retired and uh, I was asked to meet with my congressman in American Legion Hall. He showed up with about eight security people in an American Legion Hall. And I go, boy, buddy. I went to, high, I went to college with the guy. I said, what in, I said, Dan, what in the heck are you afraid of in an American Legion Hall? I don't know. I guess he decided to live in fear. Over here. Over here. Thank you for coming to Kansas. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. We have a friend of ours who lost their son due to suicide a yeah. year and a half ago. He served five tours of duty in Iraq and in Afghanistan. After that happened, we discovered there's a very high incident occurring of suicides from returning vets. What's your opinion about volunteer armies and what it's doing to the mental health of our young men? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> that's a great question. First, I'm going to, I'm, before I forget, um, tell your, if your friend is not involved in an organization called TAP.
camps, led by a lady named Bonnie Carroll. Bonnie is a great friend of mine. She lost her husband, not to suicide, but just uh, to an aircraft accident. And she really does incredible work. Are you familiar with her? They've started a group called CEVS, C-E-V-S, mm -hmm. Coalition to End Veteran Suicide. Yeah. Yeah, TAPS has been working on this for about uh, 10 years. Now, in, to get to your question, um, PTSD and suicide is not new to the All Volunteer Force. I am certainly not going to lay the blame to that. I mean, look at, look at the uh, situation that the Vietnam veterans experienced when they came home. And the big difference that the Vietnam veterans had that we enjoy that they didn't is I, we get a lot of people saying thank you for your service. Vietnam veterans did not get that and it was tough on them, really tough. And I suspect that we, and by the way, I'm not diminishing suicide. What I'm trying to say is this, this problem has been around for a long time. Now one of the issues that we have now with this particular all-volunteer force isn't the fact that they're all-volunteer. It's the fact that they've had so many deployments. That's the issue. And what happens is, is that we used to say is that when a Marine or a soldier or any other service, you know, they, they come home and they're on a, you know, they go for six months to a year and then they come back home for a, 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 a six months. They never fully unpack their sea bag, either mentally or physically. And these multiple deployments really, really wear people down. So we need better skills at identifying these problems. One of the things I will say about suicide, and we, you know, we watch the suicide rates. I get regular reports on suicides in the Marine Corps. I mean, I watch them and they're staying pretty flat. Suicide is a problem among the entire veteran community. The aging veterans are also taking their lives. And, uh, and so when you see the suicide rates, you almost have to break it down into age cohort. And once again, I'm not diminishing the problem. I'm saying that uh, when, when men and women come home from war, it changes you. The only people who are not changed when you come home from war are high-functioning sociopaths. And I don't want to go to war with a high-functioning sociopath. So everybody is changed. For some people, they're actually made better. They become more thoughtful, more resilient, tougher, and more committed, and more appreciative of life after they have experienced close brushes with death. But for some, and the scars are not visible, you don't see them, and they're carrying those scars when they come home. We have to get better with interacting with these folks, with addressing their problems. And, uh, and, and it's a tough issue. Uh, but I have to say that you don't know what causes somebody to take their own life. We tried to find trends. When I was on active duty, I mean, we would take apart every single situation if we'd have, when we'd have a suicide. We really looked at this hard. The, the generals, the sergeants, majors, the staff NCOs, I mean, this, this hurts, and we would look at it. And we, you know, first thing we said, thought is multiple deployments, that's what it is. We weren't, in the Marine Corps at least, we weren't getting a correlation. We were seeing almost equal suicide rates among Marines that hadn't deployed at all. So we really need to understand this better, ma'am. For your friend, I would really, uh, if you look, check it out, uh, they've got some incredible resources for the fr family of, of individuals that have been lost, and, uh, and it's free. Okay? Thank you. Sir? You said terror is a tactic that's used, that groups use to try to achieve objectives. I guess in my own lifetime, I've I've, I've found it harder and harder to spot what the objective is. I mean, it used to be something would happen, and you'd say, oh, that's about Israel. Yeah. Something would happen, oh, that's about the fact that the U.S. military is in the Middle East. It seems like now the, the question of motive and tactics and aims is quite muddy. 
is it really muddy or are we just having trouble keeping, um, keeping it straight? You know, uh, that's a great question. And I think it is muddy. Remember I tell, told you, you know, the first 300 uh, detainees I had down there, I could probably speak to about 60 or 70 of them. So I tried to get in their head. I tried to get to that answer, sir. One of the things I found in common with the detainees we saw there, the vast majority of them were what any civil society, I don't care if it's Muslim, Jewish, Christian, whatever, would describe these people as losers. Losers. People that had failed at marriages, failed at relationships, failed in families, failed in businesses, they'd failed. And so they were looking for something. They were searchers. They were seekers. And they were also wanting to blame people for their failures. The United States, well, that's a handy thing to blame. It's out there. Um, Jewish, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's easy. But when you try to get in their heads as to why they were doing these things, it was extraordinarily difficult. Uh, many of these folks just were lost. Some of you probably, if you ever look up the uh, uh, David Hicks, the Australian detainee that was one of the first ones picked up on the battlefield. Uh, he, uh, that gentleman back there in the red shirt, you look a little bit like David Hicks. No, I don't mean that as an insult. He's a fine looking young man. He was an Australian. He would have passed for anybody in this room. And so the concern, and I tried to figure out, you know, and he spoke, obviously, Australian English. And I just, why did you come there? Well, you know, he'd worked for a while in the sheep, sheep ranch, tried to break some horses, had a failed marriage. Nothing was going right in Australia. He decided he would it'd be a real hoot to go to Afghanistan. The big concern, of course, was is that he looked just like us. He talked like us. And the concern was is that that could be one of those individuals that we brought into, that could actually bring terrorism to uh, our shores. But I think right now, sir, that one of the things that we're dealing with is a vision of what, of a Muslim caliphate that never was. I think that there has been a, a very fine disregard of their own history to create a mythic history and a mythic future. And I think that for many of the leaders, they've been very skillful in articulating this mythic history and this mythic future. And saying that the only thing that stands away from, uh, stands in their way, is the Western civilization, the religion, the economy, all the other things. And it just seems to me that this is that we really need to do a better job of understanding the drivers that are causing this, uh, these individuals to become radicalized and then try to figure out what kind of alternatives can be offered. And I'm not talking about an olive branch. I'm just saying we've got to figure out what other alternatives are there to get them to turn away from this course of action. Because we can keep killing them and they just keep raising more. And somehow or another, we've got to get a better and more complete understanding of the drivers as to what they are. But to your question, sir, I think, uh, I, I, I think most of them are, are chasing a dream that never existed. And many of them are people that in polite Muslim society would not be considered uh, the, uh, the, the fast burners, so to speak, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the pillars of the community. Did that, did that answer your question in some shape or form, sir? Any other questions? You have another question, don't you? Okay. I just see it on your face, but go ahead, sir. 
Uh, yes, sir. You had you had mentioned that it was crucial to have that honest dialogue between the generals and the politicians. I was curious during your time in Guantanamo, when you, you your uh, opponent to it, did you get many opportunities to voice your opinion at that time? Oh, or? I had I had two very personal visits with by Secretary Rumsfeld. That's about as uh, up close and personal as a young, brand new Marine Brigadier General wants to get. How are you received? I, I mean, how? I guess I've always had the impression that, as a general, that if you don't toe the party line in some way, that you become the outcast, you're ostracized, you're blacklisted. I'm just curious what your experience was, or how far you were able to get. Let me uh, let me people. go back to something that's. Thank you for that question. Yeah, it can happen. You can, you can get fired too. By the way, there's worse things in the world than getting fired. There really are. But I want to, I'm going to start with the oath of office. How many of you here have ever served as an officer, not enlisted? I'm going, to, I'm going to make a distinction right now. Officer in the armed forces. Show of hands here, okay? How about enlisted? I know we, okay, great. Because I want you to think about the, the oath of office that you took, because there are two different oaths. There's an oath for officers, and I'm going to tell you what it is, and then I'm going to tell you the distinction, how it's different for enlisted. Okay. I, Michael R. Leonard, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the same, and that I take this oath freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and I will all and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. Here it says, I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now the enlisted oath is different. The words are included among those that you just heard, but it also says, and I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over me. What they expect of commissioned officers is to be able to have the guts to make the distinction that when a order is given that is a violation of the U.S. Constitution, you'd better have the backbone to stand up and say so. Now these things don't happen very often. I'm going to tell you that right now. They, most officers, it will never happen in their entire lifetime. But the time may come when a political appointee will tell you to do something that appears to be a violation of the Constitution. Now, if they ever made that, that uh, a movie uh, about those first days in Guantanamo, I will assure you there wasn't one of these dramatic moments where Brigadier General Mike Leonard, hopefully played by Brad Pitt or somebody better looking than me, you know, stood there and said, Mr. Secretary, I'm not going to do this. No, what I said is, Mr. Secretary, right now, I have been getting rather vague guidance regards to the treatment of these detainees. I've been told that I may be guided, guided by but not required to follow the Geneva Conventions. My intent, sir, is to follow the Geneva Conventions exactly as closely as I possibly can and to adhere to them as closely as I can. And uh, he said, what about interrogations? I said, there's nothing in the Geneva Conventions about interrogations, and there's nothing in my mission orders about interrogations. Now the advantage that I had, sir, because I probably would have gotten fired, I was only down there 100 days. They wrote a book about it called The Least Worst Place. A gal named Karen Greenberg wrote the book. Um, it's pretty accurate, with one exception. I'm neither as brave or as intelligent as she makes me out to be. But other than that, it's pretty accurate. And in that book, it became very clear, and what I'm here to tell you is, is that I was scheduled to lead Marines if we ever invaded Iraq. So the secretary is a smart guy. He really was. He's a real smart guy. And he knows he's not going to fire this Marine for being too humane, particularly when he knows he's going to leave. So they just bring somebody in that's willing to do that stuff. Had I been down there for like a year or something like that, he probably would have gotten rid of me. And, you know, that would have been okay too. You know, it's a difference of opinion. You know, the question is, is as a nation, 
you know, I have a whole lecture on torture. Uh, but I know some of you raised your hand and you said that you served in the military, and I suspect that you got the appropriate training on how to, you know, survival, you know, evasion, escape, and what to do if you're taken prisoner. Uh, I'd like to think that I'd hold out for a long time, but sooner or later, if I was tortured, I might give them something. First thing I'd do is I'd lie to them. Then I'd give them half truths. I'd make up some other stuff. And my point is, is that torture is a very poor way to get intelligence that you can uh, then really count on. So my view is, is that, uh, and by the way, uh, even guys like Napoleon, back in the Napoleonic War, said that torture was a lousy way to run a war. And he knew something about wars. He ultimately lost, but you know, he, he was pretty good at this type of stuff. Uh, maybe we're more enlightened now and we figure torture is okay. I don't think so. Uh, but I don't think that it's what we stand for as a nation. I always like to think we were the good guys. You know, we did, uh, what would happen if we had violated every pleasant fiction that these detainees had when we brought them in there? What if we treated them absolutely in accordance with the Geneva Conventions? You know, not, you know, this, not a hotel, not a Marriott or anything else, but just said, look, we're going to hold you here and, uh, until the war is over. And uh, you know you're gonna you might grow old and gray. It just all depends on how long this war goes. But if you want to help us out, you can give us a little information. You know, let them have their religion, let them have their their, their food. I, I, we actually tried that, by the way. And I can't go into this much too much detail. We tried that. The guy spilled his guts because he didn't expect us to treat them that way. I can't go into too much detail, but I can tell you that it works better than torture. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just well, gave you too much time. Now you got two questions. <laughs> um, do you believe that enemy combatants should be tried in civil court, or not civil court, but should be tried um, in a military court? Or civil court. Or civil court, yes. Okay. Is that the first question? That's the first question. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll answer that one, and then I'll, you can have the mic right back again. Sure. Because I'm really, you know, I don't handle two questions very well. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, the question was: Is uh, should enemy combatants be tried in a military com by a military commission or by federal courts? Our history of trying terrorists, and we've picked them up in this country. That's why, I, you know, we our law enforcement's been pretty good. And when they're picked up in this country, they get tried in federal courts, and the conviction rate has been pretty darn good. Our federal courts know how to do this. Military commissions, uh, heck, we hadn't really done anything like that since Nuremberg. We're not very good at it. And there's only been about six courts, six, uh, uh, and most of them, had, most commissions rather, about six of them so far, in the years that we've gone on, you know, down in Guantanamo. Uh, I think about let me get the numbers right. Three of them, they pled guilty and they got time served and were released. Big deal. Okay? Two others were found guilty and was overturned by our own Supreme Court that was the, the review. And there was one that they were found guilty and the, and the individual remains incarcerated down in Guantanamo. So if you look at the track record, the federal courts are doing a much better job. Now the other part of this is, is you hear a lot of folks say, oh goodness, we can't bring these detainees to the United States. Have any of you ever been inside a maximum security prison? I mean, as a visitor, not as a, you know. <laughs> Let me tell you, I have. Um, one of the core competencies in this country is locking people up. We do it really well. There's another thought. If you really don't, you know, I don't know if anybody knows how much it costs to keep a detainee down in uh, Guantanamo, but you have to ship everything down there by barge. It's expensive. So the cost per detainee right now is a little over $2 million per detainee per year. The cost to put that same detainee in a supermax prison, the most expensive supermax prison in this country is $78,000 per year. You're a taxpayer, you decide. Your second question, sir. There was a book that I read 
a few years ago, I believe it was entitled for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. um, more people have been killed in the name of religion than probably anything else. Yes, sir. That's never going to change. Though the United States, well, we attempt to change that on, mm -hmm. on occasion, as do other countries. Sure. I'm one of those that believes, hey, when it's time to take it to them, we take it to them. Okay, that as it may, do you believe that, or, or consider the Crusaders? You mean by the, by the Muslims? Well, yes. Okay. Yeah, going back thousands of years, of course. Do you believe that we should let them do what they're doing now and keep, I, I was trying to piece that together. Uh, okay, take your time. Do you really believe that we should put boots on the ground to stop what they're doing now or let those countries in the Middle East step up and stop them themselves. Do you, no. do you believe that we need to go back into that, that fight or, you know, or, or let it play out and protect the homeland? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you said our, our, ch our chances of, you know, or being struck by lightning are a lot better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Terrorists secure the borders as we should. Let it play out in the Middle East. Let those countries take care of what's going on over there, and not put boots on the ground yeah. and put our boys back in yeah. to that. Um, I'll answer this, and I don't want you to take this as flippantly. But how did you get to work? How did you get to this location here tonight, sir? You drove, and so did I. One of the issues that takes that goes beyond the political is the fact of the resources and the fact that if ISIS uh, controls the natural resources, the fossil fuels, is that uh, our way of life will be significantly impacted. So this, uh, this goes into the calculus of every administration, not just Republican and not just Democratic administrations, all administrations. So you've got the economic component. From an operational standpoint, I think my point was this. We are not going, with all, with all respect to the aviators and the Air Force folks out there, you do not win wars with air power alone. If it is the President's intention to actually close with and destroy ISIS, the only way that you can do it is with boots on the ground. So the decision is a national security decision, you know, because the other option that you pr proposed, assuming that we can live without that fuel, is let them burn themselves out there or let some of the other countries step up to the plate. Tough choice. It's a very tough choice. And, and, and one of the things that no politician is willing to deal with is the accusation that their decisions caused our uh, reliance on cheap fuel which I noticed right now is $2.93 a gallon here, much cheaper than it is up in northern Michigan. I let my wife know that. Uh, and so our reliance on cheap energy causes us to make decisions. Um, you know, the final thing, and you kind of touched on this, so I'm going to mention it, and, and why I'm concerned about this becoming a religious war. I didn't say, I, I, I've mentioned this in another talk, but. Uh, everybody knows where they were on 9-11 and what they did on 9-11. And I was really a busy general on 9-11. But one of the things that I did is I asked my personnel officer, among the 8,000 Marines and sailors that work for me, how many Muslims do I have? And I'm sure that that personnel officer, and nowadays you can just punch a button and here comes the roster, you know, I mean, that's the beauty of it. I'm sure he wanted to know so I could keep an eye on him. That wasn't my purpose. And that day before the sun set, I asked for the senior Muslim in my command, who was a Marine Master Sergeant, and I asked to see him. Now, Marine Master Sergeants don't just normally walk into a general's office, but I wanted to see him. And I, I first asked him, I said, Master Sergeant, 
And this gets to your point, sir, do we ever talk to him? Yeah, you betcha. I said, how do you feel about what just happened? And he said, and I'll take out the, lang the bad language, okay, because the lady's present. But he said, you know, these blank any blanks, whatever, don't worship the same God I do. This is a corruption of Islam. I am ashamed. I am ashamed. And he says, but more than that, I'm angry because I'm an American and I'm a United States Marine. And I really took that to heart. And I, and I told him, I said, listen, I said, here's the list of all the uh, Muslims in, our, in my command. Get them together. Make sure they know. I consider them Americans and United States Marines. And if they get any blowback, I want to know about it. Now, it's a credit, I think, to the rest of the Marines is there wasn't any. There wasn't any. But I think we really need to have to be careful in this time of crisis that we don't allow this to turn into a religious war. Because to your point, sir, you know, we've been killing on all sides a lot of people through thousands of years in the name of God. And God must be getting real tired of it. Did that answer your question, sir? Kind of, sort of. Thank you for your comments. My question is, um, does there need to be a change in the mindset of the American people as far as um, putting boots on the ground? And what could be done to bring about that change? Most of us are um, pretty soft when it comes to war. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of emotion is involved when you're talking about American lives. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, would it, could there be a better response Politically, if the grassroots would have a mind change as well. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think the real issue here is this. Congress, we elect Congress. We send them to Washington. By the way, I am officially apolitical. After 37 years of, of uh, being studiously apolitical, I am neither a Republican nor a Democrat. Although I vote, uh, you'll never know how I vote. My wife doesn't even know how I vote. And I do that for a reason. But I think it's Congress's responsibility to listen to the American people. And you know when the last time Congress actually declared war? Do we have any students of history out there? Do you know when it was? Yes, World War II. And yet Congress are the ones that have the responsibility, not just the right, but the responsibility to declare war. And with all respect to our elected representatives, I would say that they have avoided making that tough decision, ma'am, because they don't want to answer to you. And I think there needs to be a national debate. These are the people that we have sent to the to to, to represent us, there needs to be a national debate, there needs to be a vote. They either need to support the president or need to tell him that he's going the wrong way. But frankly, uh, second guessing him, but not give, making a vote, is really not, I mean, that's, that's just cowardly. You know, we, you know the, the, the theme of Southwestern uh, Colleges uh, uh, this week is courage. We need to see courage in our elected officials, the same courage that those young men and women are demonstrating on the battlefield right now. And I will tell you, if you're looking for courage in this country, all you have to do is look at some of those young 18, 19-year-old soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and they've got it in spades. I didn't really answer your question, ma'am, because I myself don't know. If we, you know, I'm not one of these guys that says, by golly, we gotta put boots on the ground, we gotta kick them back into the Stone Age, because I don't know if that'll work. But I do know that 
we need to decide as a nation what is the right course of action. And when we do decide, we've got to get all the American people involved, not just the all-volunteer force. You know, we've all got to just pull together, and we've got to decide what we're going to do. Because even though I tried my best to convince you that you're probably not going to die of a terrorist attack, these terrorists are doing an enormous amount of damage throughout the world. So I'm not making light of it. It's an extraordinarily important conversation that we have to have as, Amer as America. And we have to decide where it's going to go. Because if we don't lead, somebody else will. You had mentioned that uh, everything that's happened, Iran has benefited the most from this. Can you elaborate on that and explain that a little bit? Yeah, please? sure. Um, well, you know, the intention of invading, when we invaded Iraq, I think the belief was is that we could establish a country that was uh, friendly to the United States. We could secure the, the oil resources there, buy them from Iraq, and essentially have a counterpoint to the power that is Iran. Instead, what we have is a fragmented Iraq, with part of it leaning very much towards the Iranians, and the rest of it in, in, in total, total chaos. Uh, you know, what, um, how, much, how much of blood and treasure did the Iranians have to, uh, have to invest to accomplish that compared to what the U.S. did? I'd say we probably made a pretty bad deal, sir. That's, that's just my contention, you know. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they uh, are probably very close to having a nuclear capability. So we've got a number of countries out there, you know, North Korea. You know, we've got some crazies out there with some. Uh, it's this is a, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to. I don't want to make you sleep too comfort comfortably tonight. Even when I tell you that's one in twenty million for a terrorist attack. There's a lot of bad people out there. There was another question from this gentleman over here, I think. Uh, what I think I was saying before is is that I think that national service is a good thing. I don't know that, uh, uh, but I th and I think that some of those folks should be given an opportunity that go into national service should be in, in the military. But I would not suggest putting every single person of the age of 18, say when they turn 18, into the military. We couldn't absorb them. And what you would essentially have is, is a military that is not nearly as uh, capable as it is today. I don't know how much you know about uh, how hard it is to enlist in the military today, but we're pretty selective. Um, if, you take, if, if you take a cohort of people that are 18 to 21, that age group right now, fully 75% are disqualified for enlistment, either for the three M's, medical, moral, or mental. They can't pass the test. They can't pass the physical, height, weight standards, other problems. Or they've had some problems with the law. So they're out. So you've got 25% of that population left that can serve. And of that 25%, one in 25 actually volunteers. So one in 100 in our age cohort goes to war. We're pretty selective. And they're pretty darn good. So we would give up something, sir, if we just had an absolute draft, bring everybody in the military. Probably wouldn't work. But I think we should actually stress this sense of service and give our young people some options, not just a military option, but some other things that they can do as well to make this world a better place. I think there'd be some usefulness there. Sir. Well, let me tell you the, on the, the VA system thing. There's some real problems with the VA. There's also some of the best medical treatment in the world. So uh, it depends on who, you know, if you listen to one side of the, you know, one side of the, uh, the, the echo chamber, you know, everything's fine. You listen to the other side, side everything's just terrible. Um, one of the things, believe it or not, you know, you hear people say, well, well golly, the VA wastes so much money. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to be trying to pull back these, these statistics. But if you're a doctor working for the VA, 
as a general practitioner, you're likely to have about 2,000 patients on your, on your, your patient log. And you're likely to get paid about 70% of what a general pay, a practitioner would make in the civilian community. And that general practitioner that makes 30% more than you do in the civilian community has one half the patients that they have to look after. Now, and then we say, well, gee, you know, if the VA could only get more efficient, how would you like to be somebody that went to medical school and somebody says to you, how would you like to get paid 30% less and have to work twice as hard? You probably wouldn't do it. Now, there's also some terrible problems in the VA. You know, this gun decking of the, the data on the, uh, uh, on the uh, appointments and the ability to see the VA, some of it is caused by the fact they don't have enough doctors to see all these people. So, you know, when you pay for a war, you don't pay for it, you don't stop paying for it when the shooting starts, stops. Does anybody know when the last Civil War widow died? And anybody like to guess when the last Civil War widow finally stopped getting a pension check? Huh? I'm sorry, what? Uh, actually, about it was in the 70s. It was the, 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 what, if you were, you might have been thinking about some of their dependents. But we were still paying for the Civil War up until just a couple years ago. We will be paying for this war for the next 100 to 120 years. So when we make a decision to go to war, we better be willing to pay for it. So to your point, sir, if you're going to invest in a VA, you've got to resource it. And, uh, you know, the, uh, I knew General Sinsaki, by the way. He's a pretty decent man. My biggest complaint with General Sinsaki is he should have fired a few people the first two, three months when he took over. He's a pretty decent soldier. Um, and he was caught in what I would consider to be a perfect storm. You had your... Uh, a few World War II veterans still holding on. God bless them. They were using the VA. You had the Korean War veterans now reaching an age where they were needing a lot of medical treatment. The Vietnam veterans are moving in. There was all of this demographic movement of a whole bunch of veterans needing a lot of medical care. Because as you know, and I see that many of you uh, out there are of a certain age. And you know that sometimes all of us make a few more trips to the doctor's office than we used to make when we were 25 years old. So that was bringing in that, creating that demand signal. On top of that, we've got all of these vets that have been injured, shot up, blown up, all hitting the VA at the same time. And it just imploded. I think they're making, I think they're making the changes that they need to make, sir. But we've got to be willing to resource it. And as American people, if we want a war, we'd better darn well be ready to pay for it. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I did my best. Last question, please. Yes. A few years ago, um, one of our own soldiers at Fort Hood shot and killed 13 people and wounded 31. And just a few months ago, and he was Islamic, a few months ago, just recently in Moore, Oklahoma, um, a lady was beheaded, which is, both of these instances are very rare, or have been very rare in the United States. He was an Islamic mm -hmm. convert. Um, are we can somebody's confused somewhere about what to call this because it looks like terrorism, but it's called workplace violence. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Well, that that was, by the way, a similar question was asked today of and during our law enforcement panel. Um, you know, the uh, I can't really comment at all on the second event because the uh, you know the the it's a police matter. And they have decided that it is workplace violence. You know, just because you're Muslim and you kill somebody doesn't necessarily make you a terrorist. You know, Timothy McVeigh, t yeah, I understand that, ma'am, but Timothy McVeigh was not a Muslim either, okay? 
uh, and that was one of our own. The bottom line is, is that you know the, uh, you know we've got to be very careful that we don't say, well, because they were a Muslim, they were a terrorist. What they did was a very, very heinous crime. We are also going to have to deal with some of the, the, the same devils that our own military is experiencing when they come back. You know, unfortunately, uh, Timothy McVeigh will not be the last person who does something like this. Now, in the case of the Fort Hood thing, it's been very clearly established, by the way. Well, first off, the guy was, he, he, I would probably call that terrorism. I think he was radicalized from the inside, ma'am. I really do. And the sad thing is, is that there were a lot of different, there were a lot of signals that were missed in that case that should have been, that should have been seen. And there were some, a lot of good soldiers that died as a consequence of that. And one of the challenges that any commander has and by the way, any other leader, if you're a provost in a, in a university, is somebody acting a bit strange or are they going, you know, how do you know that they're going to commit a really heinous act and kill somebody or are they just weird? You don't, we don't lock people up for being just weird. And making those types of decisions is tough. But I will say that in the case of the major at Fort Hood, I think most rational people would say that he should have been caught much earlier than, than he did. But I would be careful that we don't say that, you know, if they're Muslim, they're terrorists. When, when, you know, we've got people that commit crimes and very bad crimes in this country. And the Muslim religion does not have a, uh, a corner on the market for crazies. Uh, you know, I, I will say that one of the things that I'm always worried about is uh, zealot what I call zealotry. Uh, people that are convinced that they're right and everybody else in the world is wrong. I was talking to our provost uh, earlier, and I wish I could recall, but uh, I, I, I spent last week with a very dear friend of mine, a very highly decorated Marine and a guy that ran for Congress and actually won back in the 70s. Somebody may have heard Pete, Pete McCluskey. And this is a guy that, you know, he, he always took his own way. He's 87 now and I went up and stayed with him up in his uh, olive farm and helped him a little bit. It was good for me too. And he broke out, he's a really bright guy and he brought out Marshall's uh, 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 not Marshall, uh, Madison's uh, record, a commentary on the Constitutional Convention. And he pointed to Benjamin Franklin's words, and I'm just going to paraphrase because I'm not smart enough to remember them. But what he said was, he said, you know, he got up because he was trying to convince all these other naysayers that it's time to vote. And it's time to have a Constitution in this country. And all these people had these reservations. I don't know, is this the best constitution we can make? And he says, you know, I'm over 80 years old. And he says, one of the things I've learned now that I'm this old is, is that I'm not as sure of things as I used to be. But what I am sure of is that this is probably the best constitution that this group can put together. And that I don't think we can put a better group in this country together to build a constitution. And that some of the things that I'm unsure of are probably going to be just okay, even though I have reservations. And some of the things I'm sure of may be messed up. But we've got generations to follow us that will fix this if we need to. But right now, we need to get off the pot and we need to vote on this Constitution. And it was a remarkable document. And uh, I think that we need to appreciate the fact that in this country, you know, we welcome people of all religions, all ethnicities. We've screwed it up in the past. We sure have. You know, we've been done some pretty darn bad things to people of color, people of different religions. But it's still a remarkable document, and let's work together to get this right. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your attention tonight.
General Leonard, thank you for your, your thoughts. Thank you for making the trip to Southwestern College. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sharing your evening with us. Southwestern College Professional Studies has proudly served in our community in Wichita for the past 20 years, and we're looking forward to another good 20 with you. Please feel free to linger, visit with each other, shake the general's hand, or meet some of the faculty and staff and learn a little bit more about the college if you choose. Have a good night.